Um, coming up next, we have someone who I have just gotten the opportunity to meet, and um, I don't think I'm going to get his 10,000 pounds for proving the existence of a god. That makes me sad, but it makes him right. Um, James Morrow is, has been called the Christian Salman Rushdie, and um, Mr. President is coming up here. I want to introduce Jim Morrow. Okay, you're going to introduce Jim Morrow. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> I don't read a lot of fiction. Okay, I read a lot of nonfiction. I don't read a lot of fiction. But Jim Morrow is here, and I'll tell you something. If you haven't read his fiction, uh, there's something that you have to do. Uh, we've, sell, we've got his books on sale. A lot of you have never heard of him. Those of you who have heard of him know how good he is. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to bring to the stage right now my friend and one hell of a great fiction writer, Jim Morrow. Thank you, David. Welcome to the war on Easter. At, uh, at the last minute, I decided to change the name of my talk. Instead of The Sins of Charles Darwin, it's now called The Seven Deadly Sins of Charles Darwin, a title more in keeping with the respect and deference we all owe to the Catholic Church for its brilliant theological discoveries over the centuries. You've all heard of the new atheists. I'm an old atheist. <laughs> Long before I lost my virginity, I lost my religious faith. Both events were pleasurable, memorable, and invaluable. Way back, way back in 1990, before some of you were born and when many of you were still going to church, or synagogue services, or perhaps even routinely facing Mecca. Back in 1990, I wrote a novel satirizing the follies and foibles of the Western religious heritage. It was called Only Begotten Daughter, and it told the story of Julie Katz, a young woman whose problems include being the divine half-sister of Jesus Christ Incarn incarnated in contemporary Atlantic City. I had so much fun composing Only Begotten Daughter that writing blasphemous novels became my life's work, some of them published as fantasy, some as science fiction, some as mainstream literature. Towing Jehovah, for example, in which Anthony Van Horn, the disgraced disgraced captain of a, an Exxon Valdez-type supertanker, receives a piece of startling news from the archangel Raphael. God has died and fallen into the sea, and the surviving angels expect Anthony to connect the supreme being's two-mile-long corpse to his ship and tow it to its final resting place, a tomb fashioned from an Arctic glacier. By the way, there's a, there's a meme floating around the internet that traces to my novel, Towing Jehovah. At one point, the principal female character turns to her friend and says, you know that maxim, there are no atheists in foxholes? That's not an argument against atheism. That's an argument against foxholes. <laughs> my, my most recent experiment in blasphemy, Galapagos Regained, is a loopy historical epic about the coming of the Darwinian worldview. And today, I want to share with you some interesting notions I stumbled upon while researching and composing this novel. Galapagos Regained tells the story of Chloe Bathurst, an out-of-work Victorian actress who, in 1848, gets a job as Charles Darwin's zookeeper, 
caring for the weird giant tortoises and exotic marine iguanas he brought back from the Galapagos archipelago. Darwin never really maintained a private menagerie on the grounds of his estate. This zoological dome is a poetic conceit. Chloe starts eavesdropping on the conversations among Darwin and his, and his scientific colleagues, and eventually she learns about a theoretical naturalistic mechanism behind evolution. She also learns about something called the Great God Contest, sponsored by a gang of Rakels and Sybarites who call themselves the Percy Bysshe Shelley Society. These rake hills will award 10,000 pounds to anybody who can prove or disprove the existence of God. Chloe, my heroine, resolves to enter the great God contest, having become convinced that the theory of natural selection can be construed as a corroboration of atheism. There's just one catch. Mr. Darwin, her employer, is scandalized by the Great God Contest, and he, and he refuses to lend Chloe the illustrative specimens that she wishes to present to the judges. So my heroine sees no choice but to mount her own expedition, first across the Atlantic to Brazil, then up the Amazon River to Peru, and finally along the Humboldt Current to Galapagos. In other words, the second and third of my novel are a kind of mashup of Voltaire's Candide and Jules Verne's Around the World in 80 Days. So what are the seven deadly sins of Charles Darwin? I'll begin with one that tends to get the attention of evangelical Christians. Darwin killed God. Well, not really. You can't kill God any more than you can kill Odysseus or Hamlet or Sherlock Holmes or any other fictional character. Darwin didn't kill God, but he did the next best thing. He made hash of the famous teleological proof of God's existence, the venerable argument from design, no watch without a watchmaker, a line of reasoning, that had satisfied theologians for many generations. By Darwin's day, the ontological proof, the cosmological proof, and the moral proof had all been successfully dismantled by enlightenment philosophers. Ah, but the argument from design, that one had legs, that one had teeth. Then Darwin came along and said, sorry, no, take a good look at nature, and you'll see so many instances of jerry-rigged, expedient, opportunistic, improvisational, and outright bad design that the notion of a benevolent, of benevolent divine supervision, supervision seems ludicrous. Shame on you, Charles Darwin. Deadly sin number two. Darwin didn't merely kill God in the sense I've been describing. He didn't merely kill God, he replaced God. He took the stupendous, stupendously unimaginative notion of a person-like supreme being, and he replaced it with an entity far more magnificent and beautiful than anything you will ever read in scripture. Call it the tree of life, call it the mosaic of existence, call it the tapestry of nature. Thanks to Darwin and Darwinian thought, we now understand that all living creatures are woven in a single fabric of mind-boggling scope and complexity, including the Peabody ducks. <laughs> Everything everything that is alive right now, everything that has ever lived and everything that will ever live is interconnected, interconnected, not in some dreary mystical sense, but in the most materialistic fashion imaginable. And hence, I would argue, the most transcendent. Compare the Darwinian tree of life 
with what we find in texts supposedly dictated or inspired by an omniscient supernatural creator. As I need not tell you, noble and sublime thoughts in so-called holy books are few and far between. Many of you, I'm sure, have heard of the page 69 test. The idea that you can gauge the worth of a book by turning to page 69 and starting to read. I want to spend a minute submitting our favorite holy books to the page 69 test. We'll begin with the Book of Mormon. And they that believe not in him shall be destroyed both by fire and by tempest and by earthquakes and by bloodsheds and by pestilence and by famine. And they shall know that the Lord is God, the Holy One of Israel. That doesn't sound like a divine thought to me. That sounds like something a psychopathic human being would have written, a mere human being. And now, the Holy Quran, page 69. It is not righteousness that ye turn your faces towards east or west, but it is righteousness to believe in God and the last day and the angels and the book and the messengers. And it is righteousness that ye treat women as wholly equal to men and that ye embrace the LGBT community <laughs> with all thy heart. <laughs> well, I, I, I added that, that second verse. And now, the Torah, the Hebrew scripture, page 69, takes us to the book of Exodus, and it finds God in conversation with Moses, micromanaging the creation of the priestly vestments. The ephod will have two shoulder pieces joined back and front. The waistband on it will be of the same workmanship and material as the fabric of the ephod and will be of gold with violet, purple, and scarlet yarn, and finely woven linen. Is this really the king of the universe talking? <laughs> Sounds to me like the rantings of an all too human control freak. Finally, the so-called New Testament. Page 69 takes us to the Gospel of Luke. Jesus talking. It is easier for heaven and earth to come to an end than for one letter of the law to lose its force. In other words, the law, including the ghastly books of Leviticus, Leviticus Numbers, and Deuteronomy, is binding on all Christians. What a lovely thought. So, I will now address sin number three. Charles Darwin made a shambles of what is probably the bedrock doctrine of Christianity. I refer to the concept of original sin, what John Milton calls in the first line of Paradise Lost, man's disobedience and the fall. As we know, for many centuries, the whole Christian argument turned on the presumed factuality of the Garden of Eden narrative. The vast majority of all Christian theologians who've ever lived would tell you that Adam's misadventure with the apple was an historical event as real as Alexander's campaigns or Julius Caesar's assassination. If you read the 19th century Christian philosopher Soren Kierkegaard, for example, you find arguments keyed to the alleged historical fact 
of Adam's lapse from grace, as opposed to some nebulous metaphorical notion of original sin. But then Darwin came along and said to the church fathers and to the medieval scholastics and to Kierkegaard, yes, but you see, there was no Adam. Well, if there was no Adam, then there was no lapse from grace. And if there was no lapse from grace, then there was no need for a divine Jewish rabbi, Jesus Christ, the second Adam, to arrive amongst us in the fullness of time and redeem that fictional first man's non-existent primordial sin. It's always worth remembering that when a supposedly broad-minded minister or pastor heaps scorn on fundamentalism, he or she is in fact disparaging the entire intellectual heritage of the Christian church. St. Augustine and Thomas Aquinas and the rest were fundamentalists. Today's despised biblical literalists were yesterday's most venerated Christian thinkers. Deadly sin number four. Darwin obliged us to think about two phenomena that have always made the, Abraham, the Abrahamic religions very nervous, sex and death. To wrap your mind around Darwin's insight, you must try to imagine a planet that has borne witness to unimaginably vast quantities of copulation and unimaginably vast quantities of cancellation. Copulation and cancellation, sex and death. I can't speak for all nations or all, or all cultures, but I certainly know that here in America, we have a problem with sex. We think there's something the matter with it. Look at our popular entertainment with its sniggering, leering, and adolescent understanding of the erotic. Now, if from the American's perspective, if there's something the, the matter with sex, there's even more something the matter with death. On these shores, death has always been in very bad taste. Death must be denied at all turns. As you know, this endeavor, in this endeavor, our priests and pastors and ministers are abetted by an advertising, by advertising executives who relentlessly inform us that if you purchase enough consumer goods and services, you will never age, you will never grow infirm, you will never suffer the inconvenience of oblivion. Deadly sin number five. Charles Darwin obliged us to scrutinize our naked bodies. Even though most of us, when we stand unclothed before a full length mirror, do not see unmitigated perfection, <laughs> Darwin invited us to look at our bare flesh, not with the gaze of a pornographer or the squint of a poet, but with the wide-eyed fascination of a scientist. He invited us to behold the human race and say, to quote the title of a famous story by my fellow atheist science fiction author, Terry Bisson, they're made out of meat. There is nothing wrong with being, being made out of meat. And indeed, if we take a Darwinian tour of our bodies, we find some very, very telling corroborations of the theory of natural selection. Consider the fact of male nipples. The Victorian poet Alfred Lord Tennyson famously said, woman is the lesser man. But looking at the embryological evidence, we'd have to say, man is the lesser woman. Female nipples are prototypical and male nipples are a functionless shadow of that paradigm. Male nipples aren't maladaptive, so they've stayed around, though nobody has ever discovered a use for them. Not even Jesus. 
Or consider the fact, the fact of the coccyx, the human tailbone, that triangular, triangular protrusion at the base of your spinal column. Some people learn they have a coccyx when they fracture it by sitting down suddenly on a hard surface. Women especially, because they have larger pelvises than men. So you don't necessarily need an x-ray machine to prove that your skeleton includes the vestige of a tail. My point, of course, is that while the human coccyx is functionless, it attests to an evolutionary past. It reminds us of our vanished simian ancestors and the tales they found so useful. Or consider the roots of your canine teeth. Rub your finger along your upper gum. You can do this now if you want to. Rub your finger along your upper gum and you will encounter two conspicuous bumps. Now, the visible parts, the visible parts of your canine teeth are no more impressive than your incisors or your molars. So why are your cuspids so elaborately anchored? Why are their roots so large? Because the canine teeth of our simian ancestors were evidently big and long and sharp, rather like those of a modern baboon, and we retain an evolutionary echo of such weapons to this day. Sixth, sixth deadly sin. Charles Darwin took away our right to hate each other. I must confess that in recent years, I've become wary of the, of the supposed virtues of ethnic identity, particularly in the case of white Americans who fetishize their assorted Anglo-European heritages, the whole thank God I'm Irish phenomenon. It so happens I am Irish. I was even born on St. Patrick's Day. There are more important things in this world. I've noticed that ethnically obsessed white people are eager to trace their ancestries back quite a few generations, but then abruptly they stop. Their curiosity evaporates. The project, the project no longer appeals to their sense of self-worth. Why? Because if you keep pursuing your heritage in this fashion, if you keep scurrying downward along the Darwinian tree of life, in time, your particular national identity melds into a pan-European identity, and then into an African identity, God forbid, and then into a hominid identity, then a primate identity, then a tetrapod identity, and then a Piscean identity. I'm thinking of commissioning a t-shirt reading, thank God I'm a fish. <laughs> anyway, ever since Darwin, may he rot in hell, Ever since Darwin, we cannot hate people for having been born into the wrong tribe because we're all the same tribe. We're all each other's cousins in the most literal meaning of the term. Now, the seventh and final sin, Charles Darwin emptied heaven of its population its presumed population, I should say, then closed and locked the gates. That is, he committed a real world equivalent of God deporting Adam and Eve from paradise. After Darwin, it became increasingly difficult to view our species as a bunch of tourists huddled in a bus station called the world, waiting for some cosmic greyhound coach to take us to the afterlife. You might say that Darwin, God damn him, confiscated our passports to eternity. But the story 
did not end there. Yes, Darwin confiscated our passports, but he gave us something in return. He gave us citizenship papers. Darwin, Darwin tells us that we belong here. We're not tourists on this planet. We're citizens. The earth is our home. The tree of life is our birthright, perhaps the one most worth inheriting. I'll conclude by reading one of my favorite passages from Galapagos Regained. Here's the context. Yeah, we've got a minute. My actress turned adventurous, Chloe Bathurst, has finally reached the archipelago, but things are going badly for her. A religious community of Mormon settlers has put two of her traveling companions, a sailor and a prostitute, on trial for the capital crime of blasphemy. Chloe appoints herself the primary witness for the defense. And she believes that her best strategy would be to convince the 12 jurymen that God does not exist. In other words, the final chapters of my novel offer a 19th century foreshadowing of the Scopes trial, which of course took place not too far from here in Dayton, Tennessee. David Silverman, maybe we should organize a field trip. So my heroine parades the various Galapagos specimens through the courtroom before the jurymen and before the, the, Mormon, the Mormons who are sitting in judgment on her friends. Three varieties of giant tortoise, four species of mockingbird, four species of marine iguana, all the while explicating her former employer's theory of descent with modification. As a final gesture, Chloe makes the same points I made earlier today about male nipples and the human tailbone and our baboon-like cuspid roots. Quote, as Chloe presented the illustrative canine teeth to the jury, she found herself recalling one of her famous theatrical roles, one of the parts that she created on the London stage in her first career. One of her favorite roles, the mistress of Inspector Dupin in The Murders in the Rue Morgue. In both the play and Mr. Poe's original tale, the killer had proved to be an escaped orangutan. The ape did it. This absurd trial, she realized, had the same plot. On this sweltering tropical morning, here in the Mormon courtroom, a deicide had occurred. For when a simian shambles free of the jungle and enters the savanna, when her posterity will over the course of innumerable generations discover fire, make tools, plant gardens, build bridges, write poetry, and name the stars, then God has in effect been murdered. The ape did it. Thank you. I'm going, to, I'm going to be signing books now. If you have questions for me, bring them to the signing. You needn't buy a book. I would love to talk to you. And that puts us more or less back on track. There we go. Uh, thank you so much. That will be, the signing will be in Salon F, adjacent to this room.